Okay, let's pray. I'm going to pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Lord, just thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for it. looks like we're going to have some rain here in a little bit, Lord. I just thank you for an opportunity to hang out and get to talk about your awesome word, Lord, your holy inspired word that is the words of you, Lord. Come out of heaven. Come to us, Lord. We just invite you, God, to change our lives, change the way we think, God. Lead us more into your life, God, that we might just uh, glorify you to a greater degree. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Hey, okay, you guys, so I threatened to do this, and so whatever, take, take it as a threat. But I went and I did some math uh, yesterday, some real, literal math, like what, whatever it was, 932 divided by 19 weeks or whatever, this and that. And I was going to backdate this assignment for you, but for the book of Luke assignment, starting today, if you were to start Genesis chapter 1, and you read four chapters a day, not even including some of the holiday breaks and everything, then by May 19th, you will have finished the book of Revelation. All the way from Genesis to Revelation, four chapters a day. And you've been doing six? Well, slow down. Okay, so here's the thing. So, if, look, I get it. We started late. This is going to be from now on out at Anchor House on the first day. It's going to be like assigned to everybody, but you guys are the guinea pigs that were like, you know, making it up as we go along kind of thing, as you're all aware. Because, yo, Anchor House 2023. <laughs> Yay. We. No, but I'm serious. So, like, here's the deal. If you've already started reading Genesis, you're going to read through. If you want to go faster, that's fine. If you've never read through Genesis all the way. To, and by the way, I'm super aware there's all these different programs where you read one from, chapter from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, and a psalm, and blah, 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 blah. We're going to go Genesis to Revelation straight through, four chapters a day. If you've never done it, you have to do this because how can you go to Bible school and not re read the Bible? Does that make sense? Yeah. And I understand for some of you, like that's a huge chore because you're not a fast reader. Others of you are like, oh, I've already done it three times, whatever. But I will encourage you this. Like, remember, if you're not like a Johnny super fast reader, don't get bogged down in the genealogies and how many cubits long the, you know, the Holy of Holies is and how many seal skins get nailed to it and whatever. I get it. You can like skim a little bit, but just between you and God, work it out and start reading. So that's if you start in Genesis chapter one today and you read four chapters, you'll be done with the entire Bible by the time you graduate or whatever we call it here. Did you say we're done May 17th? I thought it was 19th. It is 19th. Is it? Yes. Bingo. Otherwise, you'd have to read like 4.01 chapters a day because that would really change things. Okay, the other thing I want to share with you today is I was thinking about you guys when I came to hear the science guy talk, and I was realizing, boy, you guys have got a lot of science, right? And a lot of like, whoa, the stars and everything. And then I saw this article the other day in the paper that just made me laugh, and I want to kind of compliment you guys a little bit for being at the young age you are and thinking some deep thoughts. So do you guys know who William Shatner is? He was the uh, Captain, yeah. Captain Kirk of the Star Trek Enterprise, which aired like back in the early 60s, I think it was, for only three or four years. And then he became sort of famous for his uh, Priceline.com ads. So William Shatner is now 91 years old, right? He's 91 years old. And he has been famous for like over 60, 70 years. He's been famous and wealthy. And what happened was some um, tech entrepreneur sent him up in one of those like weird space shuttle things or whatever. So they thought it would be really cool if they could put William Shatner, because, you know, Captain Kirk, up into space so William Shatner could go to space. So William Shatner came back down from space. And I want to read you some of his comments. This is what he says. When I landed, I came out of the spaceship and I was overwhelmed by a, by a feeling and I started to weep. I didn't know what I was crying about. It took me a couple of hours to be by myself to figure out what was the matter. And then I realized I was in grief for this beautiful world, this planet that took five billion years to evolve to what it is now and all the multitude of things that we human beings can love and be aware of that are so beautiful. And never mind the elephants and the great predators and all that stuff, but the stuff today, the child, your fingers, I mean, everything that abounds, it's a miracle and it's beautiful. 
And then he goes on, but out in space, it's black. It's palpable black, as he described his view from the great beyond. And when I was looking at it, where we were coming from, I saw the beige and the blue and the white of this extraordinary place we live in. And I saw death and I saw life. And then he goes on, blah, blah, then he was famous for this and that. And then what's the next slide? He says, he says, well, you know, you can write about it all you want. You can talk about it and you can get advice from people who don't know any more about death than you do because nobody knows anything. And it still doesn't matter if you have a belief system, which I envy. I see the vibrating connection of the universe of which we are a part of and would seem likely to me. We are made of stardust and we return to stardust. But the question that we will always ask is, what happens to this thing? We're talking about death anticipating death. And I don't know of any other animal that might do that. Well, elephants mourn. <laughs> they know something. They know there's a concept of death, I think. But I don't think they ask, where does the soul go? Where does that life energy go? Of course, nobody knows. So the question is, where does the life force go? Well, some people call it a soul. Some people call it whatever. Where does all that energy go? And maybe that's what we're talking about. Just so you know, I'm so embarrassed for him. <laughs> He's 91 old and it's like for the first time he's considering wow what does it all mean you know what I mean like what it, what does it all mean like why are we here why, there's just this little planet and then there's infinite space and is there such thing as a soul and it kind of sounds like he wants everybody to know did you know that we're all gonna die did you know that it's nothing but black space out there and so here's my point for the last like couple of like weeks, three or four weeks, you guys have been hearing all this great stuff about God and creating the universe. And then my whole little lecture on the transcendent life and the material life. And here's what I want to commend you all for. That guy's 91 years old. And my guess is this. He's just been busy being rich and famous. And everybody's always going, oh, Mr. Shatner, Mr. Shatner, everywhere he goes. He's never really considered the stuff that we consider in here every day. What does it mean to be alive? How do we know there's a God? What happens when you die? We're just on this tiny little planet and there's a whole world out there. Does that make sense? So good on you all to like deeply consider the deeper things of the universe because I hate to say it, but when I read this interview, I thought I'm embarrassed of the guy. He's like shallow guy that like has never done the hard work of thinking these things through that we're thinking through. The reason why I bring that up is because just two weeks or last week, we talked about the incarnation. God in heaven comes to earth and is born as a baby. And if your head doesn't kind of explode a little bit about that thought, you need to go back and think about it again. Because if this is true, remember what I told you? It's going to come up today. If capital G-O-D, God, spoke the universe into existence, actually showed up here on the planet 2,000 years ago, and he spoke. It begs the question, doesn't it? What did he say? <laughs> okay. Well, Jesus is going to speak today for the first time. We're finally getting to that point. He's been born last week. Ah, uh, just forget it. Jesus speaks. You guys know what we talked about last week. I don't need to review it, right? Jesus got tempted in the desert. Okay. So today inaugurates the next 17 chapters of Jesus' teaching. Jesus' words are amazing, they're astounding, they're perfect, they're authoritative, they're enduring. It's amazing how the things he could say 2,000 years ago perfectly describe our lives today, and they have just as much relevance in our life today as they did 2,000 years ago. You'd, it'd be easy to think, oh, what would anybody from way back then know anything about our lives now? But everything Jesus says fits our lives perfectly, right? By the way, you might also notice nobody ever wins a debate with Jesus, right? <laughs> Anytime he gets into a religious debate with the religious leaders, whatever, he always just shuts everybody up, and it pisses them off. That's one of the reasons why they kill him. Yeah, don't ever, you know, what is, do you guys ever watch that movie, Princess Bride? Yes. What does he say? Don't, what is it? The two truths, never get involved in a land war in Asia and never fight a Sicilian or something. <laughs> I love that you know that line. Well, I got a third one for you. Don't ever argue with Jesus. You lose, right? right? Okay, so we get to spend the next few months listening to what God incarnate says. We're going to pick it up in Luke chapter 4. Uh, verses, uh, let's pick it up in verse 14. Luke chapter 4, 
14 and 15. Okay, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread throughout the whole countryside, and he taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Okay, a couple things to notice. Notice he's returning in the power of the Spirit. Remember, this is post-Jesus baptism, and what that means is his, his ministry kicked off when the dove came down. It was like, you know, Power Rangers unite or go or whatever they say, right? Boom, it kicks him off. Now he's going around him under the power of the Holy Spirit. He's teaching in their synagogues. The news is spreading everywhere. By the way, Luke leaves out the first miracle of turning water to wine. And he also leaves out the picking of the disciples. You guys know why? Because I don't. I have no idea. He just, I don't know. why. I don't know. I thought, Luke, I thought, right, I thought Luke wanted to write about everything. But for whatever reason, Luke skipped the picking of the disciples. And he picked, he skipped the first miracle, turning water into, uh, water into wine. Okay? But he's sort of at this point, he's like an itinerant rabbi that's kind of roaming around teaching with great authority did it use that word yeah uh, no it hasn't said authority we're going to get to that point in just a little bit yeah uh, but it's interesting because luke who focuses so much on the miracles luke begins his jesus story not with a miracle but with a teaching from jesus and we're, I'm going to explain why I believe that is in just a little bit. But first, um, we pick up the story where Jesus goes to church. And by the way, uh, one little thing we kind of skipped over real quick is it said news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Could I reiterate again um, that not a lot was happening in these people's lives? I mean, think about it. They couldn't go to the roller rink. They couldn't go to the movies. They didn't have TV. They didn't have phones. There's not a lot going on. And then all of a sudden you start hearing a story about this guy and this miraculous birth and then this dove coming down at a baptism. Word is spreading. People got nothing to do except talk about what's going on. Are you with me? So word spreads. And so what happens now is, well, let's pick it up in verse 16. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Oh, I'm sorry. He went to Nazareth. <laughs> He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. Okay, before we get there, first of all, um, you know, you ever have friends that are like, well, I believe, but I don't like going to church? Yes. Yeah, well, Jesus went to church, and he was God, so for crying out loud, Right? Get thee to church on Sunday morning. And by the way, I like saying that to all of you because may you never in your life find yourself doing the whole, uh, I'm not really sure if I like going to church. I don't like the pastor. Uh, by the way, you don't go to church because you like the pastor or you like the music or, or, or it helps you. <laughs> you go to church because that's where God wants you on Sunday mornings. And if you're thinking, I'm not getting enough out of going to this church, you already have the wrong attitude. You should go to church with the attitude of what can I what? Give. How can I help, right? Especially, I, what really drives me nuts is super mature Christians that are like, I don't know, man. The guy, I'm just not getting enough meat when I go. Well, excuse me, if you're a super mature Christian, do you really think you're going to get enough meat to feed you 20 minutes on a Sunday morning by a pastor who's trying to speak to guys that haven't been to church in 25 years and the mature? If you're a mature Christian, who should be feeding you? Yourself. Does that make sense? Trust me, any excuse you can come up with, I'm going to tell you, is not a good excuse to not get your butt into church on Sunday mornings. Amen? Amen. Okay, just, just want to get that, because even Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, went to church. Okay, so now here's what's going on. He shows up at the uh, synagogue. Now, at the synagogue, they normally had this certain liturgy. That, you know what that means? That they'd go through. In other words, sort of a program. Like, you know how our, lit our liturgy is we do five songs, announcements, and a message, <laughs> right? So what they did was they would read from the Shema. Uh, they'd read from the book of Deuteronomy. They would do some benedictions. Then there would be a priestly uh, blessing. And then a reading from the law. And then the last thing they would do is a reading from one of the prophets that usually had commentary added to it. So remember, they don't have Bibles. What do they have? Scrolls. scrolls. So they're like, bring out the scroll. And the scrolls were super expensive and super valuable. And so it was very common that if you had a visiting rabbi, just like we do when we have guest speakers, right, you know, 
to have the visiting rabbi give a commentary on the reading from the prophets. So here's the funny thing about what's about to happen is Jesus is going to read the, the scripture reading, and then he's going to be expected to give a sermon uh, on these verses. So let's pick up the story in chapter 17, uh, verse 17. So he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he's reading from the book of Isaiah, and um, all these physical conditions, speaking about the poor in spirit and the blind or, or whatever, they all have like, excuse me, all these physical conditions, uh, the poor, uh, freedom, blind, uh, the oppressed, they're all speaking of like spiritual ramifications, like when we talk about being poor in spirit, well, we have its um, carab uh, uh, culinary, what's the word for culinary? It's collaborating. Uh, issue right here with uh, bringing good news to the poor. Okay, this specific verse that he's reading, it is out of the book of Isaiah. It's speaking of their return from Babylon. So this is a prophecy of Isaiah speaking about the time when Israel's been in captivity for how many years? 400. No, Israel, 70 in Babylon, right? Okay, 400 is a good guess. You're right about half the time on that, yeah? 70 years, right? But here's something, a little thing I want, a little theological tidbit I want to tell you guys. It's one of my little pet theologies, and it's called layer cake. <laughs> you know what a layer cake is, right? Different layers. You got like the vanilla cream on the one thing, and then the chocolate, and da da da. It's, I learned this when I was going through the book of Psalms, and that is oftentimes a prophecy in the Old Testament has multiple layers. So David could be prophesying. And he might say, you know, set the captives free. And he might be talking about, like, the oppression right there that they're having with a battle that he's doing with the Philistines. But you could also apply that same prophecy to the Babylonian captivity. You could also apply it to um, Israel being under the thumb of Rome. And you could also apply it to our spiritual condition that we are in spiritual captivity and we need to be set free. So sometimes you come across these prophecies and they don't necessarily mean one specific thing. They might mean a few different things. And this is classic because look, when we read this from Isaiah, when we see to release the oppressed, who are we as 21st century evangelical Christians thinking about? Ourselves mostly, right? He's, Jesus has come to set us free from the tyranny of sin and the death um, from judgment, whatever. But Isaiah, when he wrote that, was thinking about, well, possibly his own time, but the captivity of Babylon. And now what these people are hearing is, now think about this, they are an oppressed people. Who's oppressing them? Rome. And they're thinking, oh, great. The time has come. He, Isaiah is prophesying about us. So that begs the question, what will the itinerant preacher preach on these verses. What do you think they're hoping he's going to say? The time has come. We're going to kick Rome's butt, right? And get them, toss them out of here, right? So look what he says, verses 20. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. What? And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing." Now, by the way, was that the shortest sermon in the history of sermons? <laughs> I told you that story when I preached in England, right? When the, la the lady said, I really, really loved your sermon. It was so short. <laughs> and I was like, hey, thank you, I guess, yeah? So, shortest sermon ever. Now, what does this mean? Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing? What was fulfilled in your hearing? Well, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, right? Okay, that makes sense. Jesus does have the Spirit of the Lord on him. He's been anointed. He's been preaching the good news to the poor. There's plenty of poor. And he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. I wonder who he's even talking about. And recovery of sight for the blind. As far as we know, he hasn't healed the blind man yet, but we know that he will. And to release the oppressed. Well, release from who and for what? And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
There's a lot going on here. What he's proclaiming, number one, is he is the one that will be bringing all these things, right? Okay, it's a huge statement. And everybody's been buzzy, 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 buzzy talking about all these miracles that are happening. And now think about this. Remember, this is his hometown, right, where he grew up in his, uh, what we call around here, Hanabata days. You know what that is? You know what a Hanabata is? Boogers and snot hanging out of your nose. So around in Hawaii, they say, oh, bro, back in my Hanabata days. That means back when I had a runny nose, yeah, when I was a little booger nose, right? Well, that's where Jesus spent his Hanabata days. And now they're all stoked because this famous itinerant pastor who they've been hearing about doing all these miracles like turning water into wine, he's come home. This means good stuff for them, right? That's what they think. Okay, so let's see how first their reaction is this. All spoke well of him. Verse 22. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came out of his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. And Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. So here's what happens. At first, everybody's all stoked. They've got this amazement. They have this hopeful excitement. It's likely they'd also heard about all the miracles. And remember, not much is happening in their lives. Wouldn't it be cool to have see a miracle right here, you know? And this new king is from our nick of the woods. This could be really good. So obviously they had heard what he'd been up to in Capernaum, and he just said he's healed some blind people, or that the time had come to heal blind people. And so this is Jesus kind of calling them on it. I know what you're thinking. You heard what I did at Capernaum, and I've probably been saving my best stuff for when I come home, but he's going to pop their bubble. Verse 24. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown, and I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleaned, only Naaman the, Syri the Syrian. Wait, what's he doing here? He's kind of popping their bubble a little bit. Everybody's expecting him to do something really cool, to do a miracle in his hometown like they've been hearing. But Jesus gets all like Old Testament on him, and he goes back to First and Second Kings, and he says, well, remember, there was probably a lot of uh, widows during Elijah's time, but he doesn't go to any of them. He goes to a different widow, and he blesses her. And then he says the same thing with, um, with Nay, what was it, Nay, Nay, Naaman, the Syrian. You guys remember that story? Naaman, the Syrian, who was the commander of the enemy army. And what Jesus is saying is, do you think Israel didn't have any lepers that Elisha could have healed? But instead, he went to somebody outside of Israel and healed Naaman. Uh-oh. Now, this, by the way, um, um, oh, by the way, <laughs> according to the New Testament, who... Who and from what tribe was the first person to accept Jesus and call him Savior, Messiah? The woman at the well. Andrew was the first disciple. Actually, I think it was Peter. You are the Messiah, whatever. It was the woman at the well who was a Sumerian woman, a Samaritan woman who was considered like less than a Jew, kind of the enemy of the Jews, right? And she proclaims him, right? And, and people are going to flip out. Okay, look what happens. Verse 28 through 30. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. What? People weren't stoked. They desired to actually kill him, which, by the way, great foreshadowing. Because look, this is foreshadowing all the whole life of Jesus. A big chunk of Israel is going to reject him. They're going to turn on him, and they're eventually going to kill him. Not just because they're pissed, because he's going out to the Gentiles. Remember, Jesus is going to be proclaiming that God's favor is going to be for all of the world. But also, he's going to point out their sin. He's going to go after the so-called righteous Pharisees. And it's going to get him killed eventually. And so Jesus goes to his hometown, 
and he gets fully rejected because he won't do the magic tricks they were hoping for. And instead, he says, you don't even understand what's going on, just like in the Old Testament when they didn't understand why Elisha and Elijah would heal others. And you're about to see more of that, yeah? And so, and then there's kind of this awkward little thing where he walked right through the crowd. It looks like a hot knife going through butter. They wanted to throw him off. I'd like to see what that looked like. They're going to throw him off a cliff, and all of a sudden he just is like, you know, nope, not now. <laughs> Remember, remember Satan said, throw yourself off this cliff, right? And he says, no, no. But the Holy Spirit must have just like parted the crowd and Jesus walks away. Okay, any comments or questions thus far? Interesting, yeah, full rejection. By the way, all through the book of Luke, he's going to be getting rejected over and over from his family, his hometown, the religious rulers. Yes, Nick? Is that true of every Old Testament prophet? No. That they went outside the nation of Israel? Or that just like they were rejected in their own town? Oh, not all of them. Not all the, I don't think all the prophets were rejected. But he, the life of a prophet was pretty brutal, though. A lot of them did get uh, abused, if not killed, actually. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Lexi? Is this his first rejection? Uh, at least in the book of Luke it is, yeah. I'm not sure. You know, it's hard to compare the timeline, and I haven't done that, so I'm not sure. But it is interesting. He goes right to the heart of his birth. I mean, it's not really his birth, but his hometown, where he's from, yeah, and is immediately rejected. He will get rejected by his brothers and sisters eventually, but we're not there yet. Yes, Kate? Is there some sort of imagery behind, like, cliffs? Because I feel like... Yeah, it feels like there's two now. Not that I'm aware of. There seems to be like this idea that a cliff is something you get thrown off, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, I mean, and you think, can you think of anything? Yeah, hyperlink. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. I can't think. Well, that's a temptation, right? The temptation. So, Yeah. Going off a cliff. And something about going off a cliff. It's like irreversible, too. That's why I was like, when you go off a cliff, it's irreversible. It's like every time you sin, you're not actually walking off a cliff. Right, yeah. What I was trying to think of, though, was an Old Testament hyperlink. So if you remind me at the end of the day, I'll try to look it up, see if there's something in the It's a good question, KT, because whenever you have like these multiple things, yes. Colby. Uh, I had a question about, <clears throat> you're talking about church. Um, and I was wondering, if you aren't like going to a church, but you're still meeting Sundays with friends at your own house and doing like yeah. little Bible school. I'm okay with that. I mean, you know, we, we could cut, what do you call it, split hairs, what, define what is church, and good luck at trying to do that. You know, what is church, you know? And what's a good church, you know? Yeah. The, the, main, the most important thing is, and uh, when Steve Farrell comes to talk to you guys, he's a real hoot. Uh, some of you have met him already, fixing guitars and stuff. He is a classic guy, like a freakazoid hippie from the 60s that like, got radically saved in a hippie commune. He's just a hoot. But he sort of disfellowshipped himself for many years. And then he's got a really radical statement to say about that. And that is, he says, you have to be part of a local body of Christ or you cannot grow. He said, it is only in the relational context of a body of Christ where <laughs> you can both offend people and be offended by people and have to forgive someone and have to be forgiven by someone for someone to be able to sort of bounce their life off of you and you bounce their life off of them. Otherwise, you're like in an echo chamber of your own little, you know what that means, an echo chamber? What do you call that? A feedback loop in your own little head and you can't possibly grow. Isn't that radical? It's a radical statement, but if you hear his testimony, it'll challenge you. So I think it's a great question, Colby, by the way, and that's, that's my only response. Be part of a local body of Christ and whether you meet on, you know, Wednesday nights or Sunday morning, blah. Great question, though. Anybody else? Madison? No, you're like, you're like, huh. 
I need to scratch your lip. OK, <laughs> should we keep moving? Because I think we can finish this next little section before we move on. OK, so Jesus goes back to Capernaum. And I want to show you a picture. You can actually go to Capernaum. That's, oh, uh, well, you guys don't know Sol and Luna, but that's uh, Uncle Louis, Luis, who's around here. But I'm going to show you something. So Capernaum is Peter's hometown. And this is actually where Jesus really hangs out for the first couple years of his ministry. They use Peter's mom's house as like a base. Does that make sense? And they take all these trips, you know, it's a three-year road trip, camping trip with all the boys. So we pick it up in verse uh, 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. And I told you I wanted to talk briefly about that. What I did want to share with you that's kind of cool is if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, there's sometimes you go to places and they're like somewhere around here Jesus was, <laughs> right? Or like when you go to the Mount of uh, Beatitudes, nobody really knows exactly, but they still have a shrine that you can pay your 10 shekels and go to and say, oh yeah, this is apparently where Jesus may have taught. But you know what's really cool when you go to Capernaum? That straight up is Capernaum, and it gets even better. They have unearthed the first century synagogue, and there's the remains of it right there. And that is the exact, exact location of the story we're reading today. And it's pretty, oh, I almost said the B word. <laughs> How about boss? That's a B word. It's pretty boss, man. It's pretty b beautiful. It's pretty awesome. To actually stand there, oh, here I go, standing now, and be like, think, is Jesus taught right here? Now, just so you know, right behind you, there's another little building, and they're like, and that's Peter's mom's house. Well, nobody really knows. <laughs> maybe that's Peter's mom's house. Maybe it's not. But that is the synagogue where Jesus is teaching. And I just love stuff like that. So let's see. First of all, it says the people were amazed, which is a cool Greek word, except pesanto. Except the santo. It means stricken, speechless. Like you're just like this. Not comatoso, which is sometimes what I feel like when I look at you guys and you're speechless, but you're speechless like this. <laughs> right? These people were speechless like this. Right? They're just blown away. This is the word of God speaking because he was teaching with a Authority. What does that mean? Well, look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Paul says, I came to you in weakness and fear with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And that's what Jesus is teaching with, with great power. Okay, now again, what I find fascinating about this is Luke, the physician, who through the rest of the book is going to be super interested in the miracles. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what it is right now. The teaching today is this. Luke understands that the miracles were never the big thing. Because for Jesus who spoke the universe into existence, for him to heal a blind man, for him to like, you know, multiply some loaves and fishes, that's magic tricks for God. You understand what I mean by that? Magic tricks from God. But remember this. Oh, I get chicken skin. We're gonna, we got a preaching coming on here. The miracles were always to point to the teaching, to give the teaching the authority. Does that make sense? Of the miracles. Okay, so the miracles were simply, look, you think that's amazing? Listen to the teaching. And here's why. What do we care if Jesus saved the life of some cripple 2,000 years ago? Did you ever think about it this way? Everybody that Jesus healed, including Lazarus, who he brought back from the dead, and also Talitha Kum, remember the little girl? The little girl that was dead? Think about this. Every single one of them, they're all dead. Right? They're all dead. They all died. Everybody Jesus healed died. So that was never what was so important. What was always important was the teaching, eternal life, the fact that he's the son of God. So are you with me on this? The reason why I say this is because normally you're like, Jesus did miracles and he taught with authority. You're usually thinking about, well, tell me about the miracle, <laughs> right? 
It's the teaching. It's the word that is going to change their lives. And so, anyways, he speaks, and a demon has to speak up. Verse 33, we're almost done here. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon. This is all happening right here behind me. <laughs> Looked a little different. Um, possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, and he cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. And all the people were amazed. The same word, speechless. And said to each other, what is this teaching? With what? Authority and power he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out and the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Notice what's going on. It's radical enough that he throws out a demon, but the first thing they talk about is the authoritative teaching. I would love to know what he taught, okay? Okay, but by the way, it's an interesting choice of words by the demon, and I, I think some of you were kind of wondering about that. The demon says, I know who you are. Isn't that interesting? The Holy One of God. Now, we shouldn't be too surprised by that, because um, you ever... You know people that are like, you know, they don't want to be Christians or whatever, and they're like, well, I believe in God. Have you ever quoted to them James chapter 2, verse 19? <laughs> oh, you believe that there's God? Good. Even the demons believe, <laughs> and they shudder. Because <laughs> it's funny to think about, but Satan believes in God. <laughs> demons fully believe in God. That demon that Jesus just cast out of that dude, oh, he fully believes in God. So there's much more to like faith than just I believe in God. Does that make sense? Yeah? Because even demons believe. And so Jesus tells the demon to shut up. And by the way, one thing I love about, we're going to see all through scripture, <laughs> I love the way Jesus never really seems to do battle with a demon. Jesus will just say, hey demon, out. They're gone. Hey demon, shut up. They shut up. Demon come out of that herd of pigs, and a thousand of them just leave. How much authority does Jesus have? You know what I mean? Jesus, this is like, you know, when they come to him, Jesus, we tried to cast out demons in your name, and it didn't work. And Jesus is like, I know, because you're weak faith. Demon out, <laughs> they're gone. Demons are like nothing. It's like, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's like if you turn on a light switch, what happens to the dark? <laughs> it's just, poof. It's just, it's gone. It can't, dark can't exist in the light, yeah? So, um... Now, it's interesting because um, why does, and it's ironic because technically the demon is speaking the truth, right? But, he, but Jesus tells him to shut up, right? Now, there's a couple possibilities about here. I always find this really interesting. Um, there's a few different theories on why Jesus tells demons to shut up, and I'm just going to tell you a few of them. Um, one is that only Jesus gets to control the narrative of his mission. So Jesus will reveal who he is to whom he wants, when he wants, the way he wants. Does that make sense? And he won't have demons sort of like spoiling uh, the narrative that he wants to say. That's one possibility. Um, the second possibility is that truth in the mouth of a demon is dangerous because you ever heard that expression, the best lies are what? Closest to the truth, just like Satan in the Garden of Eden. He doesn't tell a blatant lie. What he does is he takes the truth and he just twists it a little bit. You could go on for hours on that little statement right there. And so Jesus probably doesn't trust a demon to speak any truth because they can quickly twist it. Um, another one I heard that I don't have in my notes, but I just remember off the top of my head, is the idea that Jesus will not accept testimony about himself from a demon. Yeah? In other words, people can testify about Jesus, but he won't, he won't accept the testimony about him, yeah? And then last point about that guy is the man is violently relieved of the demon, although it says uh, without injuring him, which I thought was a little interesting tidbit from Luke, the doctor. <laughs> he says, and without injury, he was relieved. Did you have another theory on that too, Ann? Don't tell anyone. Like, it's not just demons that he's telling oh, yeah. to shut up. There's yeah. other people he's telling to shut up, too. And it's because it's not time for him to be big news yet. 
Like right. He's already big enough news as it is. Just chill for a second. I don't need to get killed yet. So we talked about this the other day, and it's a theory I, I, don't, I can't put a lot of stock in. And we had a little bit of a debate here, so I don't want to re-debate all this. But some people have said, and I don't know that I fully agree, that Satan himself didn't know the whole plan. And so, but either way, whether or not Satan knew it or not, what I think we find in all these instances is Jesus says, I will control the narrative. Does that make sense? I will tell people when it's time. And so he goes to Peter, who do the people say that I am? And then he says to Peter, who do you say I am? And that's when Peter says, I say you are the Messiah. And then it's like, okay, at least with the inner circle, Jesus is releasing the narrative under his own time. Okay, we got about four minutes left. Just a couple quick applications um, for all this. It just says that, um, well, it's kind of cool. The news about him spread throughout the surrounding areas, all his great teaching. I love these two instances with the power of his word that Luke starts out um, the ministry of Jesus. Um, one of my favorite teachers of the past one time said this. He goes, do you ever think about when you're praying to Jesus that Jesus um, spoke Saturn into existence? <laughs> right? Like Jesus, I mean, our head kind of can't grasp it. So you hear a statement like Jesus spoke the world into existence. What does that mean for us? Well, what it means is when you pray for your brother who's sick or your auntie who's got cancer or could I get into Anchor House? I don't have enough money to get into Anchor House. I'm saying that for Trisha's benefit over there. But, right? Does Jesus have the ability to help you? Yeah. Because he like said Saturn and Saturn was in its orbit, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. The power, but remember, it's not what he does, but what he says that has the influence to change our lives. And here's my point. What we believe about who he is is more important than what he's capable of. Does that make sense? Who he is and the role that he's doing, okay? And so um, at Nazareth, they reject Jesus because he doesn't fit their narrative for him. You understand? We're talking about the narrative and the story and the plan. Nazareth thinks, oh good, Jesus is here. Now we can do stuff. We're going to see stuff. And he rejects their narrative because he only operates by his narrative. And then lastly, oh, we already talked about it already. Not to be legalistic about it, but hey, man, if Jesus goes to church, we should go to church. We got 30 seconds. Does anybody have a question or comment? Nick. Yes. So you said earlier that Jesus did his ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. Now that gets a little tricky because, you know, neither you or I is the son of God. <laughs> My guess is our expression of the Holy Spirit is likely to not be as perfect <laughs> or what have you. But I will tell you this. I preach on Sunday mornings quite a bit. You guys haven't never seen it, huh? You guys never. Yeah, you probably never will. So never. Um, but I feel real serious about this, that usually when Enns is playing the last song of the five song set, I always feel like I'm not qualified for this. I don't have the ability to handle your word, God. It's too big for me, it's too much for me. And so usually what I tell Jesus is this, I sort of picture Jesus standing there at the bottom of the stairs, and I say, I won't go up those stairs unless I know that you're coming with me and that you're going to speak. And then you hear this same prayer a lot. You probably hear people pray this all the time. And it's not a cliche. I mean it from the bottom of my heart, like from the soul of who I am is, may anything that I come up with and say, may it just be quickly forgotten. But may your word, and I mean that, that's why I, you know, drive the... I drive the multimedia people nuts because I don't think anybody uses as much scripture <laughs> as I do when I preach. Because I figure even if everything I say is just blah, 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 when I read out of the word, that is God's word, you know? And I really, God, I get chicken scat. I believe it from the bottom of my soul that his word will not come back void. And my job is to get up there and present God's word. That's really what we're doing in here. We're feasting on his word. And we're pulling all this stuff out and we're speculating and I'm speculating and I love to tell you when I'm speculating, but at the end of the day, it's not my speculations that's going to change your life. <coughs> it's his word. Does that make sense? So I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's hard to tell sometimes if this is just a whack job, you know, wacky idea I have 
or if it's the Holy Spirit talking, but I always know I can rely on this to be truthful. So, yeah. I think we're out of time. You guys good? All right. If you have any further questions, see me after class. Have a great, oh, it's not lunch. You guys got to come back for more. Sorry. Go grab a cup of coffee. Get some sugar.